the pressing issue of budget cuts and how it's affecting the future of today's youth. Political parties throughout our nation's history and their impact on voters today. Tremendous steps toward marriage equality in California and what the future leaders of America have to say about it. I'm Ellen Vito. I'm Jackie Salgado. I'm Evan Narani. The UC system is made up of 10 different campuses scattered across California. Many youth and government delegates are likely to apply to one or more of these colleges at one point. You probably are aware of the pressing issue of budget cuts, but you may not know how substantial these cuts have really been. Recently, there has been a total of $650 million cut from the UC's budget, and there will be another cut of $100 million cut soon as well. How can we promote a good education when many students can't even afford to get into a good college without the help of financial aid? As government grants go down, tuition goes up. With fewer teachers and larger class sizes, the quality of educa education is declining, along with the hope of a better future for today's youth. Have budget cuts affected your life? Yes, it actually has. Um, my classes are actually like, there's 40 people inside them. It's very big. And like, you can't learn a lot. There's a lot of um, like, disturbances and it's hard to study in the class right now. Well, I mean, the current budget cuts are really affecting my um, class sizes. Uh, we have dwindling supplies and it's really upsetting me. Um, it's like I want to go to school, but with these budget cuts, like it's making me really question my education. Uh, my classes are all really big, and I'm having trouble learning as much just because they're huge. I don't get any individual attention. I'm thinking about dropping out of school. Do you think budget cuts in the UC system are going to affect which colleges you choose to apply to? Oh, most definitely. I'm not from the richest family or anything, so if there's budget cuts, I don't think I would be able to make it in any UCs that I'd like to. Well, it's hard to apply to UC strictly based on the fact that tuition keeps rising and rising. I mean, I love the UC schools, but something's got to change. Yes, I'm probably not going to apply to those because the tuition is just way too expensive and I have no money. Royce, an intern who goes to Berkeley, that has been affected by budget cuts. Budget cuts have been making a difference since, I mean, since I was in high school, you know. As the state starts to cut more and more money, like, it's already gotten up to $650 million being cut from the UC system, and that's already not okay, you know. It's already a huge lump sum that you can see everywhere is picking out a little bit here, picking out a little bit there, picking out a little bit there, you know? So One of the biggest challenges I faced when applying to colleges was financial restraint. My mom was very adamant about me only applying to a few number of schools. And then from those few choices that I had, it was, oh, who's gonna give me the most money? And I ended up actually choosing the school I go to now because it was, in fact, the cheapest because the other schools I got into were just too expensive for my family to afford. I would say that my education has been affected mostly through resources. The, it's definitely clear that the University of California doesn't have the resources necessary that big private schools have, and that's only because we don't have the funding for it. You know, like There are fewer professors, fewer professors mean fewer office hours, fewer office hours means I don't have the opportunity to interact and like get to know my professors on a one-on-one -on -one situation. Um, Things like that, just less ability to go out there and like utilize the things that I need to utilize in order to learn the things that I feel like I need to learn. I did get to choose my classes this semester, although I have been plagued with a lot of waitlisted classes and then it's really stressful because you have only about three weeks to try and get into all the classes you need and find all the units, but this semester I got really lucky and did get into all the classes I needed. Royce has been a part of protests as well as the Occupy movement. Even just being on campus, it's like the budget cuts are always present. You see written in chalk on almost every building or every sidewalk, March for B public education, you know, March 1st, that's the next big one at Berkeley. And it's like there's protests every semester about how we need to stop this. And I think it's time that someone really does something to stop it. Yeah. I sat down with A.J. Blumenfeld, the 61st youth governor, and spoke with him about his job as a school board member in La Cunada. 
Um, why did you decide to run for that position? Well, I went to these schools um, when I was in high school, so I graduated from this district not so long ago, and I had a pretty uh, disparate experience in the district. I had some really fantastic years and some fantastic teachers, and I had some not so fantastic years and some not so fantastic teachers. And I felt like there was more that could be done on providing an equally excellent experience to all students. And then I went on to college where I started to study these things um, outside of the context of my little district. And I realized that I was, in fact, correct. There are, other, there are other ways of doing things out there that may be beneficial to our district. Many schools have experienced budget cuts affecting their art programs in other areas. But AJ says that he doesn't think we've seen the worst of it yet. In many ways, our, dis uh, our state legislature in Sacramento has kicked the can down the road. So even though we've had these problems and they've been cutting and cutting and cutting, they've actually not made the really hard decisions that need to be made in order to actually address the problem. They've just kind of been pushing it further and further away. And the problem is it's compounded on itself. And so in many ways, we've been protected from the worst of it because um, that's politically you know, that's something that, as politicians in the state legislature, they don't want to have to be responsible for, those, for this hurt. But I think that we all see that that's about to end. Coming this November, it looks like, unless the voters approve these tax initiatives that are on the ballot, there's no more kicking the can down the road. It's over. You know, we're all going to have to start living a whole, you know, a whole different K-12 education system unless something drastic happens. Many mixed feelings on the topic of teacher tenure and AJ made his opinion very clear to me. No, I don't think that anybody in any profession ever should be entitled to their job for anything other than the fact that they're good at it. Um, so I'm all in favor of, prote of legal protections for, for discriminatory dismissals. I think that's fine. And in the state of California, we're lucky enough to have a pretty robust anti-discrimination laws in employment. And that applies to everyone, not just teachers. It applies to not even public schools. It applies to private schools. It applies to not just schools. It applies to all businesses. You know? So I think those things are important. But besides that, your job security should be that you are the best possible person to be doing that job. Well, the, the biggest downfall is that it makes it wildly um, unattractive to improve your performance. If you, if you make the same amount of money um, and get the same kind of benefits and get to keep your job at the exact same way whether you put in extra time and energy into being the very best you can be or not, you put in half that amount of energy. If you get the same thing out of both of those situations, why would you put all that extra work in? And, and even more frustrating is that if you're putting all that extra work in but the teacher down the hall isn't and they're getting paid as much or more than you, it can be very demoralizing. And so it's very difficult for the school system to attract high, highly competent, high-performing individuals to the teaching profession because people who are highly competent and have high performers want to be acknowledged for that level of performance. And they don't want to be discouraged from being high-performing, which is exactly what our tenure system and other, other uh, situations with regards to teacher benefits do. I don't think it's going to be turned around soon at the state level, and unfortunately in California almost all school district budgets are tied to the state's finances, which is not true across the country. A lot of states, the majority of your funding comes from your local town. In, in California, you know, over 85% of, 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 of local districts' budgets come from the state. And so what happens in Sacramento affects everybody um, in schools. And I don't think that's going to change. I don't think we have the legislature that's going to do what they need to do about it. And quite frankly, I don't think we have the governor that's going to do what needs to be done about it. And so I don't have any hope that in the immediate future, meaning five years out from now, there's going to be some miraculous turnaround at the state level. So what I think that needs to happen instead is that our local, our local uh, governments need to be that much better. We're going to need to totally rethink our teachers' contracts. We're going to totally need to rethink our classified employees' contracts. We're going to need to rethink the way we do business from top to bottom, and we're also going to need to start looking for more local sources of funding, which not every district has as an option. And not every district has a sort of community that has disposable income to be giving to schools, and those that do are going to, are, are going to have to. Rudy, who works at the Board of Education here at YNG, has experienced the pain of budget cuts already, and he hasn't even started college yet. Um, I wanted to take a chemistry class at community college and so I went and I'm not sure if you're familiar with how community colleges work but 
a lot of times a lot of people want one class so that's already budget cuts small class sizes or larger class sizes but more people like we don't have enough classes so I, I um, petitioned to get in and that's basically like you give the you give the professor your name and then they just pull your name out of a hat so me and like 35 other people were petitioning so the professor takes a Scrabble set pours 36 tiles in there and they're like only one person can be put like in my class so like you're all gonna pull a tile from this set if you get the blank one you get in my class so you know she did that to 35 people I pulled the blank one so I'm like awesome I can take chemistry now because I've never taken chemistry before um, because of budget cuts because my school didn't let me take two science classes I took AP physics instead of chemistry so my school didn't let me take chemistry which is dumb but um so I pulled the blank, uh, the blank one, and I'm like, awesome, I can take chemistry now. Um, I go home, I get an email from this lady, and it says, you can't be in this chemistry class because you're a high schooler, and due to budget cuts, we need to make room for college students to take this and not high schoolers. And then I got kicked out of the class. What are some things on a national and a state level that can be done to potentially fix the problem of budget cuts? On a state level, it's really complicated. I, I want to say something like simple, but it's not. It's not. It's never going to be that simple. Um, I'm personally a fan of like higher taxes to help support things. Um, maybe higher like progressive tax, like graduated income tax. Of course, the problem is like once you bring up taxes, that that automatically becomes a political issue, and then there's always political stagnation, and that that never really works out. So, I think the the situation in California is very very hard to deal with. I think if we can somehow find a way just get more revenue and get more more businesses back into California on a national level I really just want to cut the defense budget budget cuts affect people from all walks of life whether it's a UC student involved in riots against budget cuts or a junior in high school's experience with student priority or even a student attending private college who's passionate about fixing the issue Every year, delegates from all over California come together to learn about how they can take an active role in government. But how many YNGers really understand the political system? Today we're going to take a look at the history of our political parties and the influences that cause voters to choose a party. In 1787, James Madison first began to publish the Federalist Papers, which warned against political parties. However, one of its co-authors, Alexander Hamilton, practiced coalition building that led to the first political party, the Federalists. The anti-slavery movement of the 1850s created the Republican Party, led by Abraham Lincoln. The party resurged in 1896 and remained the majority party until the stock crash of 1929. The Great Depression inspired FDR to create the New Deal Coalition, leading first-time voters and immigrants to upseat Republicans from presidential office. Republicans gained firm control once again with the election of Richard Nixon in 1968. And since then, control of the House and Senate have often been split between both parties. The delegates shared some thoughts about political parties by completing a sentence. Can you complete this sentence? Okay. Um, you know you're a Democrat when? Uh, you really want Santorum to win the primary. <laughs> you love Obama. You just cry and want to help everyone. You're trying to raise taxes. You like black people? You know you're a Republican when? You own more than 10 shotguns. I interviewed Ryan Mormon of the Yin Yang Party to find out how he relates what he does in political parties to the government's political parties. It's very good to be able to understand what's going on within both of these parties right now. It's a very interesting time. Um, between the two parties, especially with the presidential election races. Um, there's a lot of new things going on, a lot of, um, a lot of polarization that has not been seen uh, to such an extent before. Um, and I think it's really great for people to be able to understand what's going on. Um, and quite truthfully, I'm not too big of a fan of it. I don't think anybody should be a fan of it. Um, sure, uh, stand by your morals and your beliefs, but don't be so polarized to where we can get nothing done. Political party system here within Youth in Government is probably the most real kind of thing that we have within the program. How does the Yin Yang Party relate to the Democratic or Republican Party? Um, the Yin Yang Party is kind of leftist, um, not to not to a very far extent, but what we really are, we're we're more progressive. What about you personally? Me personally, um, I'm somewhat um, I'm somewhat liberal. Uh, I would consider myself a Democrat. What are some of the influences that have um, 
brought you to this I ideal? Um, you know, there's been a lot of stuff going on. It's um, a lot of the candidates who've been running in recent years for president. Um, it's been really interesting watching them and seeing what they have to say. Um, my immediate family uh, believes in a lot of the same beliefs that I have. Um, you know, I, some of them could be passed down. I see a lot of it through logic, though. Um, I'm a big fan of a lot of the MSNBC TV, TV hosts. Um, you know, Chris Matthews, I've loved him since I was like in third grade. Um, you know, just the way he's able to present arguments. It's so logical to me. The Pew Research Center describes some voter characteristic, characteristics which affect their affiliation with political parties. African American, Hispanic, and Jewish voters are overwhelmingly Democratic. White evangelicals are largely Republican, though white Catholics are almost evenly split. Incomes under 20,000 favor Democratic voting. Men are slightly more Republican, while women are clearly more Democratic. And voters under 30 years or over 65 are also most likely to vote for a Democrat. According to the Census Bureau, the voter turnout rate for 18 to 29 year olds reached a low of 36% in the year 2000. Up until the 2004 election, efforts to initiate youth participation in politics, like the Rock the Vote organization, have been disappointing. Rock the Vote has used celebrity endorsements and popular teen media outlets. But the greatest success was from distributing a million voter registration forms at convenience stores. Registration rates almost reached record levels during the 2004 election as issues such as education and the Iraqi war became more relevant to teens. The 2008 Obama campaign boosted rates to 46%, yet without incentives of money, marriage, and home ownership, there is no guarantee that young voting rates will continue to progress. Former YNG Governor A.J. Bloomingfield gave his thoughts on political parties. Do you align yourself with a political party? Uh, yes and no. Um, I personally align myself with the Republican Party. Oh. So my position is nonpartisan, but I as an individual person have a, have a, I'm registered. Whether it was family or friends or your own personal knowledge, what initially influenced you to join your party? Uh, very taken by my own personal um, experiences with coming to success. And when I say personal, I mean my family's experiences, not my individual. Um, my parents have, I think, quite a terrific story. I mean, they came from, from pretty modest backgrounds. They worked incredibly hard, and they expected very little to be given to them. And, and it resulted in... Uh, a real big payoff, I think, for them. I think they're, they're, they remain frugal people who are still kind of very concerned about resources and whatnot, but they do it from a much more comfortable place, and it was because they work so hard. And I think that the Republican Party strives to provide that opportunity to everybody. So what do you feel is the most important issue facing our country? And do you feel that the Republican Party has the solution for it? Yeah, well, I'm a little biased. I think the most important issue facing our country right now is education. Of course, there are these other social ills um, that we'll have to tackle, and that you can't, there's no silver bullet, and education is not going to just turn all of these things around. But you really can't make meaningful gains on them until everyone has an equal opportunity, and that opportunity starts with, a, with an excellent education. And I think the Republican Party. Um, well, I think the Republican Party is still finding its way on this as a party, but at least conservative ideology and, and, and many, many big players in, in Republican politics, I do think have it exactly right, which is that you need to make the public education system a more, a more um, effective one. It needs to be grounded in competing for the best possible services to students. Um, and you know, currently, right now, that's not what we have at all. We have schools that have no incentive to improve, um, and, and I, I think that, this, that that has largely resulted in kind of a malaise through the entire system. In a system that more than any other system I think needs to be constantly revitalized and I think the public party is right on that way. How would you encourage delegates today to participate in, in their political party and be informed about, about their legislation? Sure. Well, I would say that there's a wealth of information out there. This is the information age, and it's almost impossible not to run into the information. So the question is just whether or not you're interested in absorbing it. Um, it becomes very, very easy to imagine that these are the sorts of issues that don't actually require a whole lot of thought to understand. And it's because we're so taken by, I think, the heuristics of it all. You know, 
parties themselves are kind of heuristics. You don't have to think about whether or not you are for or against something. You just have to find out whether or not the party you're affiliated is for or against it. And then you just take it for granted that you are for or against it. So the whole system, I think, is designed to keep you away from being intimately familiar with the actual details of any given problem. And I think that you just have to disrupt it. I mean, I think you just, you know, if you're truly interested in getting involved in, in a way that is more than just the passive citizenship of maybe showing up to vote every once in a while and maybe registering with a party, you know, if you're looking to get beyond that hurdle, it is going to take studying. I mean, you have, you have to know these things. You have to, and like I say, though, the information is out there. It's the information age, but you have to, you have to be interested in, in, in learning. I'm here in the governor's office with Chief of Staff Haley Adams to talk about political parties and the upcoming election. So Haley, do you align yourself with a political party? I do in fact align myself with the Democratic Party uh, in a typical YNG from California fashion, but um, I particularly think that President Obama, while although he has not accomplished everything that he saw, set out to do in his first election, is still uh, the best person for the job. Great. So what initially influenced you to choose your party, whether it's family or friends or, or your personal knowledge of issues? Well, I like, I'd like to think that my parents let me make my decisions as much as possible, but obviously I grew up with hearing their views and hearing their opinions, so you can't help but be influenced that, by that. But I definitely would say that they were very hands-off in letting me develop my own opinions. But I, I think just hearing about the world and hearing about issues uh, drove me to be a little bit more left-leaning. Hello, I'm here with Luke Guerrero of the Governor's Cabinet in the Governor's Office, and he's going to talk to us about political parties in the upcoming election. So Luke, do you align yourself with a political party? Um, I do. Uh, I've always been a Democrat. My parents are Democrats. I'm a bleeding heart liberal. It's how I've always been. It's probably how I'll always be. So do you think your biggest influence has been your parents? Absolutely. I think a lot of us are influences our parents. Um, definitely besides our surroundings, I think nurture more than nature has to do with how we align ourselves and our political views. So what other sources do you look to for information on, on issues? Um, even though I'm a Democrat, I do watch Fox News. Um, I do read uh, the New York Post, as well as the New York Times, The Economist. I try to, to diversify my sources so that I can really solidify my own opinions. So other than your parents, um, do things like religion or ethnic heritage or moral values influence you? I think we all have our own set of morality, whether or not it comes from religion or ethnic values. Um, I'm personally a Lutheran. I don't go to church every Sunday, but I call myself a Lutheran, I guess. Um, but I think my morality really was set by my parents and how my father worked his way out of poverty and how my mother um, sort of threw away the expectations they had of her and did what she loved. So I think that really my morals came from my parents rather than from a set religion or guidelines that I was always told to follow. And would you say that, that the Democratic Party is, is always aligned with your personal beliefs? Not always. Um, that's why I align myself more as a liberal than a Democrat. Um, I think there is a big difference, especially today. Um, but I think for the most part, if I had to choose a party, the Democratic Party, uh, because personally I believe that the government has the sole responsibility of doing for others what they can't do for themselves. And I think that one of the biggest difference between Republicans and Democrats is that Republicans will say, Let's do with what we can with what we have. While, Republic, while Democrats will say, it's OK if you tax us. That's our responsibility. It's part of our social contract. So I think really that that, that party does align mostly with what I believe in. Are you happy with the Obama administration? I think for the most part, I'm happy. Um, there was this sort of resurgence of this virtual filibuster, which didn't really make me happy with a say no Congress. I think a lot more could have been done if we didn't necessarily try and reach across the aisle as much. I feel that. Um, especially when there are voices that are shouting at the top of their lungs that which does not make much sense. It doesn't really help uh, the political discourse. But I think for the most part, a lot of the things Obama's done has been great, and I think he's a very good legislator. Will you be supporting him in the next election? Absolutely. Great. The YNG program provides an opportunity for delegates to gain a greater understanding of the Republican and Democratic parties. By taking advantage of informational resources, YNG delegates can use their experiences in this program as a platform to become involved in politics today. Proposition 8. It was one of the most controversial propositions on California's ballot in 2008, attempting to restrict the rights of same-sex couples to marry in California, a right that they had already achieved. This year, even more states have introduced gay marriage as a serious topic, dividing families and friends to encourage them to stand up for what they believe in. 
but what we don't often consider is the impact this issue has on the youth of America. Today, we are going in-depth to get the real details on how the issue of marriage equality affects the future leaders of this country. All right. We are here with one person, Chris, who thinks that gay marriage should be legal in California, and David, who believes it should not. Now, Chris, why do you think David is wrong? Uh, David Navasargan from the CCY delegation. He, uh, he's intolerant, doesn't believe in equal rights for everyone. That's all I got. All right. And what do you think about Chris here? Well, I think it's a little... Uh, hard-headed to call me intolerant. You don't know any of my other views on life, Mr. Lyons. Um, however... Actually, I do. I've known you for almost 20 years. <laughs> Touché. So, as I was going to get to, I think that, you know, everyone should be able to get in partnerships, but marriage, there's something holy about it, or at least many people believe that. So I think that if somebody wants to get married in a government setting, then they should be allowed to. But as far as churches go, they shouldn't be forced to let gays get married in churches. Why? Why? Oh, why? Well, the Bible states that's something holy between a man and a woman. So as far as churches go, keep it that way. As far as government and taxes go, then anyone that wants to be married should be married. So you are worried about the marriage ceremony itself, not the rights that married couples receive? Well, I just think that there should be separation between church and state. So, you know, as far as the rights go, I think everyone deserves the equal rights, but the government getting involved inside of a church shouldn't happen. That goes against our Constitution. And what do you have to say about that? I thought God loved everyone the same. I think God is for gay marriage. All right. Well, thank you very much, both of you. And, um... In 2000, Proposition 22, a voter-passed initiative, restricted marriages to opposite-sex couples. In May of 2008, Prop 22 was struck down by California's Supreme Court as contrary to the state constitution, making gay marriages legal. Later that year, Proposition 8 was created to eliminate gay marriage and restrict it to opposite-sex marriages. It, it, it passed with 52% of the vote, eliminating gay marriages. But in 2010, Prop 8 was challenged in a federal district court and eventually overturned. This year, in February 2012, a three-judge panel of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals affirmed the federal district court ruling that Prop 8 was unconstitutional. Well, we are here with Spencer Perry, and um, I just wanted to start out from the beginning, 2008, how did you find out about Proposition 8? How did I find out about yeah, it? Yeah, what was your first hearing about it? What did you hear about it? Well, my parents themselves were lesbians, and that consequently means that they're very involved in the gay community, gay information, gay news. So when Proposition 8 was first proposed by the proponents of Proposition 8, I was immediately aware of it because my parents were, well, it was a topic of discussion on our dinner table. So our reaction to that was, well, to tell you the truth, it wasn't overjoyed. Mm -hmm. It was almost a little bit scared because we knew that this case would eventually draw the public spotlight and although that can mean a lot of good things, it can also mean a lot of bad. Since our family has been threatened, vandalized, abused, and um, we've had a lot of negative press from people. It's really great to have your name in the paper. It's really, it's really great to have that kind of experience at my age, at any age. I think that people are really, they're happy that this is a fight that's being carried out. They're, it's been long overdue, and the fact of the matter is that People's rights, when they're not respected by their own government, um, it results in things of that nature, suicide, violence, and this can be the end of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that marriage itself is so important as opposed to you know, civil unions or domestic partnerships? Why is marriage itself so important to like, your parents and right. a lot of other couples in America? The reason is, is because for millennia, not just decades, not just centuries, for millennia, Marriage has been a word that has been connotated with the love and the union between two people. Now, being called something else by your government, saying that you get to be a civil union, you have the same rights in some states, you have the same, uh, in the public eye, you should be the same, but that's not true. Marriage means something completely different than civil union. Were you bullied in school for having two moms? No. Um, well, you know, it's funny. People ask me that question more yeah. often than you'd expect, but um, um, in school, people really, they're not so interested in your parents. I mean, when my friends, you know, they'll come over and they'll realize, oh, you actually have two moms, and they'll be surprised at first, you know, mm -hmm. but I've never been bullied. I yeah. live in a very accepting community, and um, 
I think more often than not, people just don't know that I have two moms. Mm -hmm. There's obviously been a very dramatic growth in accepting gay people and gay rights. Have you seen that change in your household with you know more accepting people in the world? In my family? Um, absolutely. People, people are really, my parents, my brothers and I, we're all very, very happy that we're getting closer and closer mm -hmm. to being a family. The footage for that trial was barred, correct? That no That's one correct. could access that. What do you think, what was the effect of that on you know, people's view on gay marriage? Do you think having that out in the public would have been more beneficial? The reason that it wasn't allowed to be opened up to the public was because the opposition opposed it. Mm -hmm. um, that means that the opposition had something to hide. Mm -hmm. What happened in the courtroom that day showed that the case against gay marriage is a weak one and that it's easily overruled. Where do you see your family's place in history? My, my family's place in history? Geez, you know, I don't know. You know, Rob Reiner, he comes to almost every function of the, of the trial. And during those functions, he's coined the phrase that this is, we're making history. He says it over and over again. And I think it's true. I think that this is a historical step for civil rights. And it, might, and it very well may be in a few history textbooks. So how has Proposition 8 played a role in your life personally? Um, well, it's played a kind of a peripheral role, mostly because I, I haven't tried to get married in California ever. So uh, it hasn't affected me personally. Uh, but I have followed it rather closely, and actually I had an internship after my first year in college where I worked a little bit on um, marriage equality more broadly, and that was about the time that Prop 8 was first being overturned. What message do you think this is sending to the LGBT youth of America? Um, I think it doesn't send it, I, well, let me say this, I think it's, there's a hopeful message in that it, there's clear trends away from laws like Proposition 8. Um, I think that if we were to have the same election again today in the state of California, we'd have a very different outcome. So I think that uh, LGBT youth should be encouraged, and I think, you know, you can see that probably a lot of them are encouraged by the different stories you hear. Um, by what I believe is a turning tide on these issues. Now, obviously there's been a huge improvement in gay rights since you've been born. Do you think it's been a big jump in gay rights? Oh yeah, I see a huge jump even from the time I was in high school, and I was only in high school three years ago. So um, I think that it's a sort of issue that's so uh, ripe and sensitive right now that every year there's a, there's a pretty colossal jump. What do you think is the biggest misconception holding people back from voting for gay rights? Well, I'm not sure it's a misconception at this point. I think we've come to a place uh, as a society where, for the most part, we've done a pretty good job of convincing the people who can be convinced, um, which is why I think that, um, I mean, there's obviously still more work to be done on that front, um, but I think that that's why you start to see public opinion polls are shifting now so that the majority of people across the country are, are okay with things like marriage equality. So I think that, you know, people who can be convinced are being convinced. Political fights, though, are not always the same thing as just convincing someone something's a good idea. There's other things involved in political fights besides just logic and reason. Yeah. And the last thing is, is that I think there's always going to be a holdout of people who have severe moral or religious opposition to it, and it's not a misconception, it's, it's just their conception. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then so what are your hopes for the future of gay rights? Well, I'd like to see... Um, a whole host of issues addressed. I think marriage equality is important. I'm glad that we spent a lot of time talking about it. Um, and I know a lot of resources go into, into bringing marriage equality to people, and I think that's great. But there's also kind of a host of other things that I think are um, also don't send the right message, aren't good for our society as a whole. Um, you know, gay men not being able to donate blood, for example, I think is, sends a pretty vitriolic message to that community. Um, there's adoption rights issues that I think are really bad for families. When marriage was illegal, my husband and I, who is not her dad, we chose to get married. So we went to the courthouse. Who were our witnesses? My daughter and her partner. They were the witnesses to our marriage, but they could not get married themselves. That's wrong. Yes, that's good. Okay. With all our passionate YNG delegates, future decisions regarding marriage equality will be interesting. AJ Blumenfeld, Spencer Perry, and many other delegates have shared their opinions, and now we want to hear what you have to say. Tweet us at YNGTV and let us know. I'm Evan Ronnie. Have a safe ride home, delegates, and we'll see you next time.